the reason for doing the respiratory system at the same time or in the same general time frame as we do the digestive system is that the reason for both of those systems has to do with aerobic cellular respiration. So for the respiratory system, it's the mechanism for pulling air into the body, which then allows for the exchange of carbon dioxide, which is a waste product of respiration, and the absorption of oxygen. Okay, so function. The function of the respiratory system is really simple. Get oxygen in, in the form of O2, molecular oxygen, um, and be sure that carbon dioxide leaves the body. Carbon dioxide is not something that our body has any way of making use of, even though we do need carbon and oxygen. So we really just have to get rid of it. So the way that that happens is a process referred to as breathing, which is also called ventilation. And once ventilation has occurred, then there's ex what's referred to as external respiration, then internal respiration, and all of that has to happen before cellular respiration can happen. So ventilation is made up of inhalation or inspiration and expiration or exhalation. And in both of those cases, there is no exchange of gas between the inside and the outside of the body. It's simply the movement of atmosphere from outside the body, maybe this isn't, this is a weird way of saying it, but out outside the body. So sort of what the lay person would think of as outside the body to an interior version of being outside the body, which is being in the lungs. So atmosphere that is pulled into the lungs is still not technically inside the body. In terms of the re respiratory tract, these are the major structures that we're gonna be talking about. Nasal cavity, the nostrils, which are also called nares, the oral cavity, the pharynx, uh, the larynx, which is what we use to make sound, the trachea, which is the main airway, the bronchi, which are formed where the trachea splits, and then the lungs themselves, as well as the muscles of inspiration and expiration. In this class, we really focus on inspiration or inhalation and exhalation at rest. So you want to kind of keep that in your head as you think about this. When we talk about which processes are active and require the use of ATP and which are passive, we're talking about sort of imagine you're sleeping um, or you're just sitting on the couch chilling out. We're talking about ventilation during those kind of situations as opposed to during exercise. And then in terms of sort of little bits of vocabulary that can help with decoding words, pneumo refers to air and pulmo refers to the lungs. So pulmonologist studies lungs. Pneumonia is called that because it is associated with our, our airways and our respiratory tract. So when we talk about the respiratory system, people describe it in two, two complementary ways. If you usually when people talk about respiratory anatomy, it's split into the upper and lower respiratory tract. So that would include the upper respiratory tract, all of the structures, including the larynx. So from the larynx superior in the body. And the lower respiratory tract is from the trachea on down. If we talk about the physiology of the respiratory tract, people break the system into conducting zones and respiratory zones. Conducting zones are, in fact, are most of the anatomy associated with the system, and they are simply conducting atmosphere from one place to another. The respiratory zone is a very specialized set 
of cell structures that are opposed to one another. And that's where what we call external respiration or gas exchange between the body and the environment occurs. So the lungs themselves are hollow organs. Normally, when you're breathing air, they are the hollow areas are filled with atmosphere. The lungs lie inside the thoracic cavity, which is marked off by the lower margins are marked off by the diaphragm, which is represented by the arched line here. Each lung also sits in the pleural cavity, and the the pleura, which is the set or the name for these sets of membranes, it's a double layered serous membrane, and the area between the two sides of the membrane around each lung are filled with pleural fluid, which like the like peritoneal fluid is a very thin serous lubricating fluid. So if we think about the upper respiratory tract, we have the, the nares, which are the, the nostrils. We have the nasal cavity, which is from the nares back to the nasopharynx split in two by a structure called the septum. And septum is Latin for wall. When you have it, uh, so this structure looks almost like it would be the opposite side of the nasal cavity, but it's actually the wall between the left and right sides. So the nasal cavity are open spaces. They're lined with mucous membrane, as you would expect for a structure that appears to be inside the body, but is in contact with the outside world. And then we've got, we've got the uh, nasopharynx, the uvula here, um, which is going to flip up to prevent material from entering the nasal cavity, the oropharynx with the tongue, the epiglottis, which is going to flip down um, when we swallow to cover the opening to the larynx. The picture all the way on the left is a transverse section through from an MRI through someone's head that has a deviated septum. And you can sort of see by looking at that image why if you have a deviated septum, particularly if you have allergies or a cold, you're going to have more difficulty breathing. You might snore as you try to pull air into the conducting zone. So the upper respiratory tract is, is protected. Well, the nasal cavity is protected in a number of ways from particulates in the air that we inhale. So there's a, as I said, mucous membranes that the mucus traps dust, small particles. There are also the nasal, the openings of the nasal cavities are lined with stiff, short hairs that are not cilia, but actual hairs that are meant to trap your particles, tiny bugs, for example. So the functions of the mucous membranes are first to essentially trap particulate matter, but they also, because mucous membranes have a lot of blood vessels, the small, <clears throat> excuse me, small blood vessels called capillaries that are, that allow for easy exchange of materials across the surface that allows for air to be warmed and moistened as it's pulled into the uh, rest of the conducting zone. And that's important because external respiration, which happens deep in the lungs, happens most efficiently when air is closer to body temperature and when the air has a certain um, moisture content. We also have these crazy hollow spaces in our heads, where places where the bone is hollow, called sinuses, frontal sphenoid, the F noid and maxillary sinuses that drain into the nasal cavity by fairly narrow tubes. We have associated with our eyes, lacrimal glands or tear glands, 
and those drain also into the nasal cavity, which is why if you're having a cry often, uh, your nose will run because you're adding additional moisture to your nasal cavities. So we talked about the pharynx last week. So we've got the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngeopharynx. And again, I want to point out the uvula here and the epiglottis. So the glottis is that opening into the larynx or the voice box, and then the trachea sits underneath it. The muscle that you see between the larynx and the beginning of the esophagus is part of the upper gastroesophageal sphincter that when we swallow relaxes so that bolus of food can pass into the esophagus. This image is showing us looking down into sort of a view from above looking at the vocal cords. So the epiglottis, let me go back to this for a second. The epiglottis sits or when it flaps down, it's essentially flapping down to cover the opening of the, the larynx. So when we look at it in this picture, this is the front of the body, the anterior of the body, and then this would be the posterior of the body. And because we're looking down from above the epiglottis, it just looks like a, a pair of, um, it looks like um, an old Mick Jagger's upper lip, as opposed to a young Mick Jagger. <laughs> then we've got the, the glottis, the opening of the trachea um, under, which you can see underneath, and then the vocal folds or the vocal cords themselves. To really get a handle on the respiratory system, I have to introduce you quickly to the three basic types of blood vessels. We're going to talk a lot more about them next week when we talk about the cardiovascular system. You have arteries. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. That is the only thing that defines an artery. It doesn't have to do with whether the blood that's inside those vessels is oxygen rich or oxygen poor. Capillaries are, very, are the smallest blood vessels. They are made of a single layer of squamous epithelium. And because the, you have simple ep squamous epithelium, right, a single layer of really flat cells, that's a perfect avenue for gas and nutrient exchange because whatever needs to cross from outside the body to inside the body or between capillaries in what we call systemic circulation. So I go to my go-to part of the body, the big toe. The capillaries in our big toes are going to allow for oxygen to diffuse out of the blood and into tissue fluid and carbon dioxide to move in the opposite direction, right? The opposite gas exchange would happen in the lungs. And then veins carry blood back to the heart. Again, the oxygenation status doesn't matter. Tiny arteries are called arterioles. Tiny veins are called venules. All right. So if we look at the lower respiratory tract, the trachea, is up here and the the darker brown structures that you can see are rings of cartilage that allow for what's called the patency of the trachea which is a fancy way of saying that it's hard to crush the airway because it has these c-shaped cartilage rings the trachea is lined with ciliated columnar epithelium so remember cilia are those 
structures on the uh, surface of the cell that are sort of like a, a, a lawn of grass. They're short projections of the cytoskeleton. And in the trachea, those are going to be moving. They're going to be moving any mucus up toward the pharynx. And that's a, a way of trying to keep material from ending up in your lungs because unlike the digestive tract, there's no outlet to the lungs. So it's better to swallow mucus than it is to have it end up in your lungs. I've made the boxes different colors here because the, the ones that are outlined in red are the actual respiratory system structures. And then we've got structures of the cardiovascular and skeletal and muscular systems that participate in the in respiratory function in blue. So from the, from the trachea, the trachea splits into two and those two initial, the initial split, those are called the main bronchi or primary bronchi. So bronchi is plural, bronchus is singular. And you're almost always gonna be looking at an anterior view well, let me back up for a second. First thing you want to do when you look at a diagram of anatomy is figure out what the view actually is. Because if it's an anterior view, then left and right are going to be reversed compared to your left and right as a clinician or as a, a, a person looking at the patient or at a diagram. If you're looking at a posterior view, then left and right are the same as your left and right. So this would be this would be the left lung and the left main bronchus. The bronchi split into secondary and tertiary bronchi until you end up with what are called bronchioles, which are very tiny parts of the conducting zone that are maybe a, a millimeter in diameter at maximum and they end in the air sacs or alveoli. At the base of this diagram, we can see the diaphragm, which is that dome-like skeletal muscle. It's the major muscle of respiration. Right above here in the center, which actually isn't in the center in real life, is the heart, which is not drawn to scale just because it's not what we're focused on. And for here, we have the pleural fluid and then the pleural membranes right above that. We continue northward, we have the intercostal muscles. So the costal cartilage is cartilage associated with the ribs. So the intercostal muscles intermeans between. So these are the these are the muscles between the ribs and they take part in inhalation as well. And then the top blue box on the left is showing you sections through the ribs. Okay, so part of the reason why earlier I really emphasized that the only, the only definition of an artery is a vessel that carries blood away from the heart is because arteries in the lungs carry deoxygenated blood. So blood that is low in oxygen and high in carbon dioxide. And that makes sense, right? Because the reason that you send blood to the lungs is to get rid of the waste carbon dioxide and to recharge the levels of oxygen. So the pulmonary artery is going to be shown as blue. Blue just is that color blue just tells you that the, the blood contained in that vessel is low in oxygen. It doesn't tell you anything about, again, it doesn't mean anything about artery versus vein. The pulmonary veins, carry, which are carrying blood back to the heart, are carrying oxygenated blood, which is why they're shown in red. And that's something, that's an important thing to remember as you start to, when you do the lab for this week, and as you're sort of looking in at more uh, magnified views of the system because you won't necessarily have the heart 
as reference. Okay, so the lungs, we've got two. They're described as cone-shaped, which maybe if you have them laid out flat, I suppose that's the case. Excuse me, the right lung, which is this lung, um, has three lobes and the left has two. And that's a function of the, or, or not, I'm not sure it's a function of it, but that reflects the fact that the heart is actually pointed toward the left and occupies more space on the left side of our chest. And then we have the diaphragm, right? And as you guys saw in the lab last week, and as it'll be in the lab again this week, the diaphragm is this sheet-like muscle. And, you know, if you're looking at a pure, purely at a section, a frontal or coronal section through the body, it might be just drawn as a dome-shaped line, but the anatomy is quite a bit more complex than that. Okay, so trachea. The trachea is, now we're in the lower respiratory tract, um, still conducting zone. So the trachea, same thing as the windpipe, it sits anterior to the esophagus, and the walls of, you can sort of see in this, uh, pseudo 3D drawing the section of the trachea, there are these C-shaped cartilage rings that are connected in the back by a band of smooth muscle. The, these C-shaped cartilage rings keep the trachea from collapsing, which is important, right, because that's the airway and you don't live long if you are deprived of oxygen but the band of muscle in the back allows for the esophagus. So I'm moving over to the image on the right hand side, which is a section through, a transverse section through the neck. We've got the esophagus in the back, the C-shaped cartilage rings, um, which have a different staining pattern. And then you can see that the, it's possible for the esophagus to push into the area of the trachea when a bolus of food is is passing through and that can happen without restricting the airway significantly so as i said before the the upper respiratory tract and um, the trachea are lined with pseudo stratified the prefix pseudo means false so it looks stratified because in the sense that the nuclei aren't all sort of at the same um, vertical level when you look at it in, in cross section, look at the cells in cross section. But they all, um, if you look carefully, they all contact what's referred to as the basement membrane, which is a thin sheet of connective tissue. So on the left, you have an, an, a view of cartoon of this tissue showing you mucus with some stuff trapped in it. And then on the right, you actually see the tissue itself. And the, the cells that produce mucus are called goblet cells because they sort of look like a clunky old goblet or wine glass, except for it's not wine, alas, it is mucus, which is produced. Part of the reason that people who smoke for years develop smoker's cough is because the smoking deactivates and eventually can destroy the cilia. And that leads to more mucus and debris ending up in the lungs and coughing is a reflexive response to material being someplace in the respiratory tract where it shouldn't. It's our body's way of trying to dispose of it. So we've got the trachea here, and the trachea splits into the right and the left main bronchi. And then from there, you have secondary and tertiary bronchi. Um, if you are going to be a cardiopulmonary surgeon or a pulmonologist, you'd need to learn all of this anatomy and be able to name it. But thank heavens, you are not, and neither am I. <laughs> All of these passageways until you get to the ducts that lead into the air sacs or alveoli. In addition to being 
lined with different kinds of mucous membranes. In some cases, right, in the trachea, you're going to have a lot more goblet cells than you're going to have in a, a tertiary bronchi, for example. But in addition to cells that can produce mucus, there are also bands of smooth muscle that um, encircle the airways. And that allows, right, if, you, if those are constricted, it's going to allow less air to pass. And if they are relaxed, you're going to get more air to flow through. So the asthma rescue inhalers lead to relaxation of that muscle, which allows for easier breathing. Still just talking about the conducting zone until we get to the alveoli. So our lungs are made of the bronchial tree and alveoli. And the reason why the lungs are considered hollow is that what's inside the air sacs, the alveoli and the bronchial tree is atmosphere. So what we're looking at in this image is just the bronchioles uh, what's referred to as an alveolar duct, um, which leads into the alveoli, and then the alveoli, which are sort of shaped like grapes. In other images that I'm going to show you, you'll see that the way this mechanism works is that you have capillary beds that cover the surface of every alveoli, every alveolus. Alveolus is the singular, that the sort of grape-like structure is a mechanism for increasing surface area, right? If you have something that you're going to blow up with a gas, you, it's not going to be folded in the same way that you might have folding, for example, of endoplasmic reticulum to increase surface area, right? Think about a balloon. We don't have square balloons or not that you can fill easily with the atmosphere. So it's simpler to build the system by making circular alveoli. This is the respiratory zone. That's it. The alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries that are on the surface. The alveoli are composed of simple squamous epithelium. Can't really tell that from this image, but simple squamous epithelium. But even here, um, there are specialized cells that produce a very specialized watery mucus called surfactant. And surfactant decreases the surface tension of water. Soaps are surfactants. Right, so if you think about it, if you have surfactant is a phospholipoprotein. So what that means, right, you guys have learned about phospholipids. Phospholipids have a polar end and a nonpolar end. And the same thing is true for these surfactant molecules. Water is really sticky because it's polar, right? So without surfactant during exhalation, the walls of the alveoli, if they touch one another, would stick together because water has such high surface tension and because air contains water vapor. Surfactant prevents our lungs, uh, the alveoli, from collapsing. It allows it to be easier to reinflate them with inhalation. Surfactant, the part of the problem for premature infants is that surfactant isn't made until fairly late in development, right? The gestation in humans takes plus or minus 40 weeks, so 38 to 42. And until, depending on their genes, they're going to start producing surfactant between 28 and 32 weeks. So preemies struggle to breathe because it's very difficult to reinflate the lungs until surfactant is produced in their bodies. Now, initially, what people did to combat that was to increase the level of oxygen support, right, to put a little nasal cannula on the baby, on the preemie. But the problem with that is 
that it turns out that that additional oxygen often results in damage to cells in the retina and permanent blindness. So at some point, I don't know the actual history of this, but I assume like many things in medicine, it was sort of a Hail Mary. Somebody said, hey, I know where we can get some surfactant at the slaughterhouse. And in fact, it's still how surfactant is obtained at this point, because um, although people have been trying for quite a while to make artificial surfactant, it doesn't work nearly as well as surfactant from cows or sheep. So there are just a few that do this work and they do it very quietly. They go to slaughterhouses and they essentially immediately after the animal is sacrificed, they vacuum the lungs and then the surfactant is purified from what they pull out of the lungs. Okay. So as I said before, the alveoli are the only structures in the respiratory zone. Everything else is conducting zone. There are two things that should alert us to the fact that the blue vessel is a pulmonary arterial and that is the fact that the blood vessel is coming into the capillary bed surrounding the alveolar sac and the alveoli and the other is that it's blue right and the reason you send blood to the lungs is to pick up oxygen. And the way it gets there is by being sent there from the heart, which is the definition of an artery. So we have the pulmonary arterial on the right, and then a pulmonary venule carrying genated blood back to the heart on the left. We've got the pulmonary capillaries oops, here. The lumen of an alveolus here. Sometimes these are also uh, referred to as the atria, or the, the singular would be the atrium of an individual alveolus. Here we're just pointing to an alveolus. We've got an alveolar sac, which is made of multiple alveoli, and then bronchial. So if we look at histology, so this is very up close and personal, probably a magnification of a thousand times life size. A pneumocyte is a lung cell. And you can see really clearly here that the, you see the squamous epithelium of the alveolus. And then you don't need to know the difference between type one and type two pneumocytes. If you, care type two are the ones that make surfactant type one are the ones that are involved in gas exchange over on the right image we have a capillary which is also a simple squamous epithelium you can see some red blood cells in there and then i've drawn arrows to show the direction of gas exchange so oxygen is going to diffuse uh, with the concentration gradient from the inside of the alveolus into the blood and carbon dioxide is going to take the opposite path. It's also simply powered by concentration. And because oxygen, molecular oxygen O2 and carbon dioxide CO2 are both tiny nonpolar molecules, it's simple diffusion that powers this process which makes sense because if we had to use ATP to pay for gas exchange, you can see how that might be problematic because we need the oxygen to recharge ATP. So you could run into um, an energy crisis. This is just showing you cartoons of the same kind of histology. And the real point of showing you this is to emphasize the fact that that you have what we, it's referred to as the the respiratory membrane is this thin two layer I mean, it's referred to as a membrane because these two structures are in such close contact with one another two layers of squamous epithelium one in the alveolus and the other the capillary and those very flat thin cells allow for very easy gas exchange. 
and remember that the lining of blood vessels is called endothelium.